What is the most used man-made material on earth? You guessed right, it's concrete. Look around, it's everywhere. Sidewalks, driveways, foundations, floors you stand on, and even entire buildings are made out of concrete. So why don't we discuss it more? In each episode of Concrete Logic, we will explore one concrete related topic with the help from industry professionals that are shaping the future of the trade. We'll talk with suppliers, contractors, architects, engineers, specialists, and even some proponents of competing materials about their views of concrete and their vision of its future. Welcome to another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast. And today I have Dan McCoy with me from RL McCoy, bridge engineer, bridge builder. Uh, we have some more questions to answer from the Myers Lawson School of Construction um, at Virginia Tech. I uh, still have a bunch of questions to uh, try to answer for these students. Uh, again, Ashley Johnson, associate professor. Um, sent me these questions and we've been chipping away at them. So uh, I think the last episode was uh, with Dr. Belkowitz. We, we, we tried to answer some of them and then I did an episode prior to that and Dan's going to answer some bridge questions for us today. Um, but before we get started, I just want to remind everybody this is a value for value podcast, meaning that I do my best to bring guests like Dan on the show and provide you a value. Um, And then all I ask is is if you believe there's a value there to provide a value back. And there's three ways you can do that. You can share the podcast. So share it with a coworker, colleague, um, anybody that you would think that would get something out of the podcast. Um, And then you could go to concretelogicpodcast.com. Uh, there's a couple ways to send me a message. There's a contact button on there. You can shoot me a message. I've had folks do that. Um, there's also a little microphone, uh, that you can leave me a voicemail as well. And we actually played a voicemail on the last episode that someone left us and had a, a guest suggestion. So that was awesome. And then the last way is the donation button. Uh, that is on the homepage as well at concretelogicpodcast.com. Um, so you can donate any amount. And I just want to thank a couple people that did that recently. So Jason Stubna, I hope I'm not butchering your name, Jason. Uh, he donated $25 and he says, thanks for doing what you do for our industry. Really enjoy the guest you have on Jason. Thank you very much. Uh, and then, uh, my wife donated as well. She's got a weird amount on here. I have to ask her why she donated twelve dollars and forty seven cents. That's an odd amount. Maybe that's all that was in the bank account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then uh lastly I would like to uh thank Thomas Ginther. Uh he also donated uh ten dollars and eighty cents and he uh I know he he uh covered the uh stupid PayPal transaction fee. So it allows you to do that. So that's, I appreciate that Thomas. Thank you very much. So those folks will be listed as a producer on, in the show notes. Um, that's how that works. Um, so, uh, again, thank you guys, uh, for donating to the show helps, helps greatly. Um, with that, Dan, let's get into these questions that these, these students sent over to us. They're, I mean, they're really, really great questions. Um, really impressed with the uh the level of the questions that we received from this group um so this first one dan uh let's see i believe this is the first one i sent you if all the bridge bridges are federal federally owned then wouldn't the maintenance of the bridges be up to the government to perform now with a large number of bridges failing throughout the u.s and if the maintenance was not properly performed then wouldn't the government be to blame when a bridge collapses also shouldn't the government be allocating more of its resources to fix these bridge bridges promptly and that is uh from dan charters and it looks like he's graduating this year so congratulations dan he's got a he's got your name too dan I could just tell by his name he was a brilliant guy i could yeah i could just <laughs> and and the questions are are spot on um and it's very confusing to people you know, how our, our infrastructure system works. 
we talked about last time, well, the time before last time about, um, you know, how the ASCE grades our, our infrastructure. And, and obviously it's not just bridges and roadways. They separate those two. Um, and they consider that surface transportation. Um, but the bridges um, are technically, um, in 2011, there was, there was a, little law ca- uh, a little law passed, and it basically says, I'll summarize it up here, that uh, the bridges um, are the responsibility of the state that they're in. So the federal government has delegated that responsibility to the state. Um, and they, they define that, the federal government defines that, as any uh, bridge structure that is in use by the public is responsibility of the state. Um, you break that down a little bit more, and then you get into municipalities of, of local cities and counties. Um, each state's a little bit different. The state is technically responsible um, for maintaining and or rebuilding that. The caveat being um, they are allowed to, or they, they get funds from the federal government um, to do this work. Um, so, and, and there's, there's kind of this mandated protocol that goes through. It's the National Bridge Inspection Program, or the NBIP. Um, <clears throat> and what, what those states do then is they, they, they can either do the inspections themselves or they can delegate that inspection. So on a state matter, usually in Indiana, um, we have state uh, employees that actually are bridge inspectors, and they, they've been through programs and classes that – that make them certified as bridge inspectors to be able to rate these um, structures as, you know, uh, on a scale so that they can either be, be considered okay, not okay, structurally deficient, um, or what areas, even in that inspection, what areas need to be done to maintain or not uh, to avoid a posting or a, a rating change. Um, and in Indiana, and like many other states, then the state can delegate literally delegate to the counties and the cities, hey, this is your responsibility now um, to be able to uh, make sure and monitor these bridges in, in your local municipality. And in Indiana, they, they have a cumulative bridge fund um, that is funded every year by the state that does, that are allotted to, e- that are allotted to each county um, so that they can, the counties can opt out of it, but that is your help from the state government and then also it's from federal tax dollars too, to go in and maintain these structures. Um, but there's a lot of bridges out there. There's, there's an awful lot of bridges out there. Um, and to get to the second part of Dan's question with, uh, with a large number of bridge failings throughout the U S now I, I may have mentioned last time it's on average that you'll have one structure failure, uh, every day in the United States. Um, now a lot of them obviously aren't like the Francis Scott key bridge, which wasn't what I would consider a structural failure in the classical sense of a structural failure. Um, it was more of accident or, or incident related collapse. Um, but you do have at least one structure that's, that's brought out either because, um, either because it, 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 it it's just aged itself, um, uh, into an inad- inadequacy, um, or, or there are other, uh, environmental reasons for this collapse. Like, uh, there's, there's a lot that has to do with, you know, a washout and scour. There's a lot, you know, you, it, you, you take something out from underneath something and, and it's going to fall down. Um, that's one, but it, it's important for everyone to know that the government, I believe is, is really trying to do its best when, um, with the resources they have. And it's, it's, when I say government, I mean these regulators like the Federal Highway um, and their, their local state governments and departments of transportation. I, I really do think they're doing their best with what they've got. But it is Congress's responsibility, as they hold the purse strings, um, to fund. And, and we do get transportation funding. Um, but as the American Society of Civil Engineers will tell you, and it's their job to tell you this because they're an advocate for all of us, um, is you're not spending enough. Um, and, you know, if, if you wanted to replace our nation's infrastructure since, you know, the date that it was passed in 1954 by Eisenhower, you're, you're, you're talking um, several 
trillion dollars, not just these one or one point two trillion dollar bills um, that were recently passed. I mean, this is all meant. And you know, when I, when we have these fly-ins in D.C., I, I try to explain to our legislators that you know it seems like a lot of money, but there is a lot of road miles out there. And one of the things, you know, a lot of us may be listening to this now thinking, well, it's just a way for me to get to and from work. Um, but you got to remember that's, that's a big source of commerce. You being able to do your job is a big source of commerce. So our national uh, transportation system, our surface transportation, um, is a huge deal when it mean in, on the impact of the economy, which is why we should be taking care of it. Um, and other of it goes, you know, to, to transportation and trucking, you know, odds are, if you've got anything in your home or on your house right there, it was delivered at some point by a truck. Um, and they need roads and bridges to be able to move these goods, um, and services across the country. So to be in, in total agreement, um, with what Dan said, uh, shouldn't the government be allocating more of its resources to fix these bridges promptly? I'm a bridge guy. Of course. Yeah. All of them. No, you know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to say that, but, um, there are other things that also need attention to, um, for example, the grid, uh, the grid probably gets a, a worse rating, um, than, than bridges and highways. And it continues to, as, as we continue to add more and more power and we continue to use more and more power. Um, and then we've got, you know, problems with people. Uh, adding solar panels and, and, and their own private being able to push it back into the utility and into the, into the grid causes a lot of problems that, that, that's, that's meant for long-term solutions that nobody's really thought up yet in terms of grid solutions. So that, that's one that's, that's pretty big. And then the other one that goes with our national infrastructure is, is seaports. Um, and uh, odds are, like I said before, if, if you've got anything in your house, odds are before it was brought in on a truck, um, it was probably shipped here. Um, you know, we, we happen to be a net importer of, of these everyday goods. Um, so it's one of those that's probably also a lower grade on the list is, is the seaports, uh, airports, and then obviously surface transportation. So I think overall, it, this may be worrisome to most, but I think overall the bridges actually have the highest grade um, in our infrastructure system. Mind you, that's probably a C. Um, on a on a on a graded scale, you know, A, B, C, D, and F. Um, everybody else is around a C minus D or an F. But uh, the bridges are we're right up there. We're on average, you know, we're around that seventy five percent, eighty percent mark. So you know, we're 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 doing our part here. Um, but that's what's important when you consider funding. We're doing all this funding now to maintain. Literally, the, these these trillion dollars is meant to maintain most of this, um, and most of it is in small repairs. We're not adding a lot of new infrastructure, but we're getting to the point of most of these structures were designed with a 75-year design life. And if you look at the implementation uh, being signed in 1954, let's give everybody five years to build it and then add 75 years. We're coming up to 2029 and 2030 of most of this uh, our national infrastructure being structurally obsolescent as far as what they were designed and intended to do. Now, us engineers like to put a large safety factor on things and assume um, bigger things and worse things happening. So I think we've got more time than that. But, you know, in reality, on paper, theoretically, um, a lot of this stuff in our entire system should have been changed over at least by 2029 or 2030. Um, and I think as most of you drive around the towns and local communities where you at, you can probably find that that's probably not the case um, where you see a lot of uh, new highway, new transportation going in. So to answer Dan's, I hope that I, I hope that answered most of what uh, Dan had in mind uh, for that as far as how funding works and coming from the federal government down to the state governments. It kind of trickles down so you can use state funds and federal funds um, to, to be able to, and you can apply for more funds if you're a local municipality, um, to be able to help with some of these issues. Uh, but uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not like they, they intentionally run the bank dry on, on these things. They try to continue to have them funded. But when you only have an infrastructure bill that's only meant to last for five years, 10 years, and then you have another infrastructure fight for this stuff, 
um, and then you have to share it with the rest of what we consider infrastructure. Um, there's by the time you by the time you, you rain it down and, and each goes into their individual puddles, um, bridges are bridges are very important and they are funded for the most part. But do we need more? Yes, obviously. Um, I don't think you'll ever catch me saying no with something like that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dan, Dan McCoy, uh, we got two Dans going on here. Dan that asked the question, and Dan McCoy. Uh, uh, Dan shared uh, this website. Um, what, what is this? ARPA? Is that what they call themselves? Mm-hmm. Uh, American American Road and Transportation uh, Builders Association. So A R T B A Bridge Report dot org. If you go to that uh, website. They'll give you a full report on all the on the bridges uh, in the United States, and then you can click on your on your state. So if I clicked on Virginia, I'll give you a report on the uh, Virginia bridges. Tell you how many bridges they are, which ones that are traveled the most, um, all kinds of data in here. It's pretty cool. That, that's um, probably one of the most fun sites too. And the other little caveat that I really like that they put in there that's checked, you can either view it by state or you can view it by congressional district. And uh, it's amazing yeah. how some of those congressional districts are really good and some are really bad. Um, and then you can directly report that to your representative. Hey, why, why, why are we so, why are, why are we in the, in this one, the red is good and the blue is bad, I think. Um, yeah, why? Well, I, 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 that's confusing. I it it, is, like con- they, they, it they, is confusing when you look <laughs> at it. it. You, you look at the overall, the overall ratings. But um, it's uh, it's a really cool site. If if you can, I know if you're if you're listening on your phone, you can't really do it. Uh, but if you know, that would be an awesome link to be able to post if somebody was listening at work. Uh, yeah, if I'll you put can it. Do it. It's it's really cool to be able to look at that and go, oh. Well, I know where this bridge is. And keep in mind, I think this was done in 2021, 2022, something. So some of these bridges may have been worked on and some may be fixed now. Um, but it's kind of nice that the somebody's somebody is keeping an overall track on the stuff uh, Yeah. when when you're when you're looking at it. But it, it's a nice, comprehensive thing to, to realize, like, how you know, like California has, I don't know, 24,000 bridges. Um, Indiana actually has 19,000. Um, Tennessee and Kentucky are right up there at nineteen twenty thousand, and and some states don't don't have a lot, uh, but th- there's a there's a lot of structures in there, and that's a lot to keep track of. Yeah. No, that's uh, I can personally say I I know uh, like around the Richmond area they're definitely working on bridges and um and uh, when I traveled down to Virginia Beach obviously they're doing the big uh um hampton roads bridge and tunnel work and the chesapeake bay bridge uh and tunnel work those are enormous projects but uh they're definitely working on it it's just uh that that work takes a long time it it does it it does and the rehab you know usually I, i get questions like that a lot for from people like the Brooklyn Bridge and the and the, the San Francisco uh, Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate, um, you know, it's like how can they build that so fast? And, and it's like, well, when you're building something brand new, um, you generally don't have to deal with a lot of people and traffic being around it. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's, but if you're replacing or repairing, you know, that element um, or that asset, as it's termed, an asset is still viable and usable and you want to keep that viable and usable to maintain local commerce through the area and the region. Right. I mean, you know, not to get into the Francis Scott key bridge, but you see what happens when you immediately close down two avenues of production for commerce, the bridge was closed down. And then because of the bridge being down, you close that entire port. Um, it, it, you know, those, those problems begin to compound and compound. It's something that you really take for granted because it just works. Um, But then a mistake like that, you know, takes out twofold what's there. So the impact on the local economy is huge. And then because it's a port, the impact on the nation's economy is huge. So when people say, well, what's it worth? Well, what's it worth not to have? 
Um, you know, what's the cost of not having an element uh, that, that's meant to do its job that nobody's thought about for 75 years? Uh, and then you find out real quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know a lot of that um, cargo traffic um, that was that was uh, destined for Baltimore actually ended up in Virginia at the Norfolk uh, terminal. So, and they even <clears throat> the crew, uh, cr the cruise ships that are supposed to go to Baltimore are now coming down here to Virginia as well. So, I guess uh, some of us are benefiting from that tragic uh, event. But uh, I mentioned tunnel, so this next question, Dan, sure, uh, actually is about tunnels and bridges. Uh, are bridges harder to maintain over time than tunnels? Tunnels appear like they would require more maintenance to ensure a cave-in does not happen, but do bridges need more attention over time? Short answer is yes. There are a lot of ifs. Um, in that statement, um, bridges are exposed to the open environment a lot more than tunnels are. And usually if you're dealing with a tunnel, um, you're dealing with something that was cored through rock. Uh, it may be a softer rock, but it, it was cored through there. So you, you have the um, integral structure of the media that you've went through that's providing a lot of the support. Um, so if you can manage the water which is the ultimate killer for all of our concrete and steel infrastructure. If you can manage the water and the salts that eventually uh, end up uh, causing those, those long-term corrosion uh, problems, you can actually do fairly well with tunnels as far as maintenance goes. Um, you know, I, I think the Scandinavian countries have, have shown that uh, very well. Uh, they've, they, you know, it's just one of the things that they have to deal with and they've done a very good job at um, isolating the infrastructure element from the element that they're going through. And when you can do that, um, you can greatly reduce your maintenance. Um, and when I mean maintenance, I mean your, your heavy duty maintenance, like replacing panels or, or replacing structures in the, the pipe system that may be considered the elements of the pipe uh, tunnel. Um, but if you can, constantly maintain a pumping system and a ventilation system, um, which may take more routine maintenance on a day-to-day -day, uh, factor that you're supposed to account for in the cost. If you can do that, then you're really saving that asset uh, for the long term. Um, you're, you're literally paying pennies a day to keep, you know, a couple billion dollar asset working, um, which, uh, you know, in, in some of these, some of these larger bridges and larger tunnels, what you'll see a lot of the time is a, it's a toll-based uh, method. So it's a use-based tax on, on a lot of this stuff. And, and they end up doing fairly well because the stuff that they do for light maintenance, um, they can pay for uh, immediately. But then the overflow from that, you know, they can invest and put it into account that actually ends up maintaining the structure over time to an eventual uh, bond or, um, or a lease for uh, total replacement in some cases. Um, but yes, bridges, bridges are, depending on the design, depending on the design, uh, are a lot more labor intensive to maintain, um, in the types of applications we're talking about, we're not talking about a bridge down the street from you. We're talking about a bridge, um, over a bay versus a tunnel under a bay. Um, I would say in those two applications, the bridge is going to be a lot more to maintain over time than the tunnel would be, um, the costs may be a little more for the tunnel um, in terms of maintenance, but those are everyday preventative maintenance items, you know, replacing pumps, replacing airflow networks. Um, you know, there's a lot of HVAC that goes into that to make it safe. Um, you're essentially going into, it's kind of funny, you know, Seth, we, we, we do a lot of safety stuff and I laugh because, um, you know, we have these standards, we have these standards that OSHA puts out uh, this is my caveat. We have these standards that OSHA puts out about, you know, safety railing and fall protection and what those heights have to be. But it's funny if you walk down uh, an interstate bridge um, for railing that's meant for a car, the top of that railing doesn't even meet the OSHA standards for guardrail for fall protection, uh, which is kind of funny. And then the same thing uh, for tunnels. You know, we are told as workers, you know, what confined spaces are. And um, then then we have these infrastructure elements where we allow you and your family of five to just drive through 
you know, uh, basically a confined space. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of this stuff that, that us construction workers look at and scratch our heads and uh, they're used for everyday infrastructure elements. Um, that's yeah. just my, that's just my little caveat, but yeah, ho hopefully that answered the, the maintenance question, um, as far as more maintenance or less maintenance. Um, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, with the bridges, you're out there every day, or at least, uh, once a year, maybe you're repainting or repairing little elements here and there with a tunnel, it's going to be an everyday maintenance and probably a program of maintenance people that watch that they're going to view it more as a building. Um, then, a, you know, a bridge, you're going to have inspectors that go out and they're going to take attention to detail to certain things, but a tunnel, you're actually going to physically monitor that day to day, um, and make sure that that asset's taken care of. I hope that was as clear as mud to, to people. And, and I don't know if I answered the question as to which one you should build given an A or B, um, because I don't think it's that easy. <laughs> yeah. I think I could sum up your answer by saying it depends. Yes. Yes. It's, it's a, that's why I said, I, when you said that to me, I was like, that's a really tough question because it's a lot of, it's, it's a lot of where's it at? Uh, what's it going to be used for? What are the like, like scenarios? Yeah. Uh, obviously if I'm building a bridge in Antarctica, it's going to require an awful lot of maintenance, a lot more than if I just, you know, tunneled through the ice shelf underneath and put concrete there. Yeah. Uh, so environment has a lot to do with it as well. But maintenance wouldn't dictate what they build uh, as far as if they had to choose between a bridge and a tunnel. No. It, it depends on what the traffic is going yes. over or under it's, it, it's right? It's all transportation based, you know, and, and for something like the Francis Scott Key Bridge, um, you know, that's one of the things that you that you have to look at is do I have a lot of maritime traffic there or um, you know, if a tunnel's going under something, um, let's say it's, uh, you know, a mountain, um, and then you have a valley between the two, you're going to integrate a bridge with it, or you're, you're going to run that tunnel around that crossing, um, and, and end up with some tricky transportation green book problems, um, through a tunnel for sightsee distance and stopping and things like that. Um, but usually it's dictated, um, more so on the needs of the transportation element that you're trying to provide. Yeah. There's a cool video out there. If you just Google Hampton Roads uh, Bridge Tunnel, so HRBT, HRBT, um, they just, uh, the, the boring machine, the tunnel boring machine just broke through its first leg. And Isn't they have a awesome? video. Yeah, they should have the video of it breaking through. That's just pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So you, you hope your layout, you hope your layout guy is right on point with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and maybe a lot of people don't understand that. Another caveat, right? We've got a whole other chapter where we can go into mining and and um, and you know how mines are made and tunnels are very much the same way. You know, we we go outside and our directions are very easy. You know, we've got uh, north, west, east, south, and um, and we've got bearings and longitudes and latitudes to go by. But guess what? When you go underground, there is no, there is no GPS signal. Um, so w when you're trying to lay that stuff out uh, and meet certain points and make sure that your, your position is relevant, um, it's a little trickier. It's a little trickier doing, doing your layout underground than uh, when you've got clear skies uh, and line of sight. Yeah. That's a, that's amazing uh, technology, that machine. Uh, last question, say a bridge's foundation, which is concrete needs to be completely replaced for whatever reason. The foundation is 50 feet underwater in a river that the bridge goes over. How would this be replaced? And what are some common issues that occur while performing this work? Does this happen often? It's a very specific thing. Do you think this is a project this guy's working on? I think gal? so. Or maybe not. <laughs> you know what? He's going to be really disappointed with the answer. Um, the most cost effective option is to abandon it and leave it in place. Um, so the new design would not be in conflict with the old foundations. Obviously you're replacing the foundations. Um, and you usually you can, you can shore that up if you've had a foundation failure. 
um, you try to fix that from from underneath. But when he says replacement, I'm thinking he's had total failure, which means probably the superstructure is probably a not a good enough shape to save. So usually in, in things like that, what you do is you avoid conflict with the lower foundations because a lot of these are hundreds, hundred plus years old, 80 to a hundred year old. Um, and even if you have the plans, the geotechnical engineering back then was to the point where we really did drive wood piling, you know, 20 or 25 foot wood piling on three foot centers. Um, we can't guarantee huh, anymore. Um, we, as in finding an engineer to be able to put a stamp on what the rated bearing capacity I could prove is for a new superstructure going over. Um, so usually what you end up doing, and we've got a few this year, um, where that is the case, what usually what you end up doing is you, you, you broaden that out. So your open waterway is larger. You end up increasing the span of the superstructure, which means you move your foundations for your new structure out further so that they're not in conflict with the old. Um, and then when it comes to demolition, as you're taking it down, you want to take that to two foot below the stream bed. And um, a lot of times, you know, if you put some turbidity curtains, you have more environmental issues to be concerned with. But if you're going to put a causeway out there and turbidity curtains in to be able to catch debris, you can usually um, demo that down to two feet below the surface, cap it off with um, usually some form of scour protection, like a large rock. Um, and, uh, and then you can be able to build your new, be able to build your new foundations outside of that to create a larger area. That was not an exciting answer. I think what they wanted was, hey, Dan, how would you do this? So the logical answer is avoid it at all cost um, because that does get cost intensive when you do that. But uh, let's just say I had to do that. So we're 50 feet underwater. I don't know what our substrate is, whether we're going into a rock, where the rock is. Maybe we're not. Maybe maybe we're looking at something that, that has a very, um, maybe it's like a delta condition. Uh, where it's 50 foot down, but we have a lot of uh, uh, sediment build up over a couple hundred years. Um, and maybe maybe that rock is 40 or 50 feet below where the dredge line of um, that uh, bottom of water elevation is. And then, then they're going to hear really cool stuff from me like, well, I would build a huge cofferdam. Um, and, you know, and then obviously rail it, rail it up around that as we remove the superstructure. Or if we're just talking about, um, gosh, this is such an interesting question. So let's leave the superstructure alone. Let's say it's in perfect condition. And then let's say that we want to replace this uh, substructure element, this foundation. I can't ever imagine us really having to do this, but this is kind of, of a cool thought experiment. So you would build temporary supports. Um, prior to, uh, to support the superstructure. And then you would go and you would literally use, um, a, a coffer dam around that foundation. So you would drive impervious sheet piling around it, maybe seek it piling around it. And then you would begin to pump the water out. And then obviously you've got lateral pressure changes that would go in. So you probably have a, a support probably every 10 feet on the way down. Uh, interior to fight that pressure back because you would never 50 feet, you'd never find something that would work uh, uh, with with that kind of hydrostatic pressure as a single system. So you're supporting it all the way down, you get it down, you dry it out, you have continuous pumps running, um, and then you begin to rebuild that foundation um, and you destroy the cap that um, you build it again and you work its, you work its way back up with uh, probably concrete. Um, and then once you get up in place, you uh, devise a temporary bearing situation and then cast the, the concrete in place to fill it in later. And then you pull all the, all the good stuff after you backfill for your foundation. And then you, you pull the coffer dam and remove the causeway. Um, and as, as you're removing the causeway on the, uh, out, you remove the temporary supports for the superstructure and finally let it bear on the foundation. I would highly suggest we never do that. But <laughs> sounds expensive. But <laughs> but that's how I would do it. <laughs> yeah. But most of the time it's mitigation. It's just avoid that problem altogether. And if, if they have the funds, usually you, you implement a larger structure. Or sometimes if, if the flow has changed that much and maybe somebody's flood managed better, or maybe the, the routes 
of of water have changed in the area? Sometimes, sometimes you can't you can't do this a lot, but sometimes you can actually decrease that span um, and and choke that area down if you can dictate or prove in your calculations that you're not impacting the upstream or downstream water elevation. Um, specifically, there's a lot of environmental and hydraulics that get involved in the geometry of the structure, uh, at least at the opening of the waterway. Sometimes you can make it smaller, but a lot of times you end up making it bigger. What 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 if it was just a brand new bridge? How do they pour the concrete in the water? Well, like I said, a coffer dam. We they would do, do a coffer dam for each one here. Yep. Wow. You would do a coffer dam or you could, you know, in, in some situations like back, you know, where you've really got to get down and do the masonry work. If you were going to do masonry, um, then you're talking about caisson work. Um, and that's a whole different animal um, in itself. And, and that is incredibly expensive, obviously. And, and the safety parameters there, which are also just compound that problem but usually if you can open it up to a coffer dam you can do that because you need to be able to drive piling or if you're on rock you, you actually need to be able to core into that rock and then set your foundations and then pour that up and then place a mass foundation there um, and then be able to work up with your pier and stem system so yeah, like you would normally you'd normally you'd normally surround all that stuff with a with a coffer dam and then quite literally pump the water out and huh there you are in the dry hole in the middle of a river we do it that's all the great. time <laughs> that's great that's nuts huh yeah i was thinking you sleeve it you would sleeve it like a case on but yeah. you're saying that's more exp that's more expensive huh yeah well i uh, hmm, it depends if you're if you're trying to repair if you're doing something new it, it is easy to to go out there and put a coffer dam in it really is um, but if you have to work around existing elements, yeah, yeah, what you're saying is pretty. Now, you can. There's nothing wrong with, we're talking concrete because this is the Concrete Logic Podcast. Um, uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, once that concrete is mixed uh, per ASTM C94, and you're not mixing it anymore, but that concrete weighs about 140 pounds per cubic foot, and water weighs about 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. So when you place a heavier substance with a lighter substance, the lighter substance will be displaced um, and the heavier substance will sink. So I've, I've seen a lot of people argue that you can't pour concrete in water. Yes, you can. It's going to displace that water. And, and as long as uh, the cement is hydrated when it goes in, it's not going to take on or change the water cement ratio. As long as you're not still mixing it while it's in that water. Um, but you've literally got, you know, you've, you've literally got your concrete mix good and ready to go. Um, and you're not going to mess with it or mix it in with that water. It will literally displace that water. So there's a lot of operations where pumping um, underwater is viable, uh, especially for, for things like a mud sill. You know, if, if you're going to do that, um, if, you're, if you're going to put a, a coffer dam in and then you want to shore up the bottom from coming in, uh, from those lateral pressures, one way to do it is to place a concrete mat foundation down there. It's like not a typical mat foundation, but place a bunch of flowable fill or mortar in there. Um, and then once it cures, you know, it takes compressive stre stresses extremely well. And then you can begin to pump the water out. So a lot, a lot of this fun bridge construction stuff, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. All right. Well, I think we answered that question. Um, I think we'll uh, or save our other topic for another episode, Dan. Um, but uh, thank you for coming on the show. Is there anything else you want to say about bridges before we go? This is this is your this is your world. We're oh, talking. Oh, oh, bridges. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I I would say to anybody listening, the, the, probably the most important thing you're going to do in 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 your daily commute is 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 cross a bridge to get where you're going um and i would just say you know thank a local bridge contractor for that maybe your local bridge engineer and realize that we probably are the most important people you meet on a daily basis <laughs> I, I i don't i don't know how you don't argue i mean 
No, it's, it's just one of those things, you know, a lot of people don't know that they've gone over a bridge until there's a problem with it. You know, it's a thank yeah. you job. If you, if you build a bridge right, people don't even know there's a bridge there. But, boy, you put a bump in that thing, and, man, everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. It's it's no. just it's just one of the it's just one of those things whether you know whether whether you're dealing with classic flyovers um, to make things easier for transportation systems you know you see a lot of that in, in metropolitan downtown areas where you just don't have a lot of real estate to work with well they start building bridges to go over other bridges you know in those flyovers um, and transportation wise it's a wonderful solution um, to be able to s- literally stack traffic on top of of each other. Um, and it's incredibly efficient. And then you've got other bridges like we were just dis- discussing, you know, obviously you're going over water. There's an, um, you know, there's an element there where you have to maintain that for people to be able to go across an impassable surface uh, for surface transportation. But yeah, yeah it's uh, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing and miraculous when you think about it. The next time you're going down a dirt road, you know, try driving it at 70. Um, um, for any law enforcement officers listening, I, I didn't really suggest that. But, you know, if you try going that fast on a dirt road, you'll realize it's almost miraculous that we're able to do uh, 150,000 vehicles per day, per day on an interstate at 75 or 80 miles an hour. You'll realize what it takes to make that happen. Um, and it's pretty miraculous. And we just, you know, we just consider it to be what it is, you know, when we're out there driving it. But, you know, at some point, at some point down that was a, it was a dirt path and, (laughs) and things like large trucks weren't thought of and things like, you know, uh, traffic moving at 75, 80 miles an hour in line, repetitive motion, millions and millions of cycles of load on a structure. Um, it's pretty impressive when you think about our infrastructure system as it exists today, which is probably why it's pretty expensive to maintain, but it does have a value to the, to, to the community and to the country. Um, for moving goods and services. And until we invent a flying car um, that everybody can use, I think I'm going to have a job. I think that's, a safe, that's a safe bet. <laughs> All right. I, th- I think this is a good spot to end the day. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. I will put uh, Dan's contact information on the show notes so you know how to get a hold of him. And also the, uh, the ARPA um, link there too so you guys yeah, that's really check cool. out the, i would say if yeah. the rest of you forget about my information that's just fine but that <laughs> but open up that website um and and play around a little bit and um and looking at those those structures and deficient structures they'll update that and then also check the american society of civil engineers um they do a fantastic job of rating our infrastructure every year they put out a report card um and they get very specific about where the needs uh, need to be met um I would say everybody should probably visit that and uh, just open their mind a little bit about how much we rely on in the infrastructure world um, to maintain our peace, civility, and and stability. Yep. All right, Dan, thank you for coming on the show. And until next time, folks, let's keep it concrete. And that concludes another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast. I hope you got some value out of that episode and learned a thing or two. If you did, visit our website, ConcreteLogicPodcast.com. Click on the Show Support tab and learn how you could be listed as a producer of an episode. Again, that's ConcreteLogicPodcast.com. Click on Show Support tab to learn how you can support the show. And as always, Mike Dutton will take us out. Put some diesel in the lights and wait till the trucks roll up And this ain't how most folks live their lives Dripping in sweat, working overtime But while their time, their ties for their nine to fives We're out here changing these skylines with
working hard to get 